Thanks, Doug. Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. This talk's really about changing the conversation about how we talk about patients. And when we talk about disease severity, it's not a talk about disease indices that we think about all the time. And when I've heard about disease severity, it's often a, a litany of scales and scores that we need that end up being great for clinical trials, but personally, I don't feel it helps us too much in the day-to-day -day care of our patients. But more so, it's the day-to-day -day planning for the future of our patients that we have to think about. So these are great in their own right, but not what we'll talk about today. It's really to start changing the conversation away from disease activity and more terms this towards this term of disease severity. So disease activity is important. It reflects the cross-sectional assessment of biologic inflammatory impact on symptoms, signs, endoscopy, histology, and biomarkers. This is what you see right now in front of you. The patient who's coming in, they have a certain level of disease activity. However, disease severity is really different. Disease severity is about the longitudinal disease course and historical factors that provide a more complete picture of the prognosis and overall burden of their disease. Disease activity is how's your patient today, where disease severity is what has your patient's course been over their history since diagnosis. And I would argue that if you're thinking about this, this is more important in your planning for what you're going to do that moment or what you're going to do over the course of their treatment as opposed to how they're feeling at that moment. This is what I and probably you think when you've reviewed their history and you're getting ready to walk in to the office to see the patient and you're thinking, is this somebody who's had bad, complicated, severe disease or not so bad, uncomplicated disease? This is what you tell your nurses or your, your fellows when they're about to go and see one of your patients. Say, this patient has had really bad disease. You don't mean that they're just finishing a flare. You mean they've had a really difficult disease course and that you need to be thoughtful about what you do irrelevant of how they're feeling at that moment to plan for the future. And I would argue that this is really more important when we're seeing our patients to think about their overall disease course that sometimes gets lost in the moment of how are they doing right now as opposed to what's happened to them in the past and what might happen to them in the future. So Crohn's disease has a lot of forms. We've seen this figure many times and talked about in different ways, but I want to make the point that this patient's disease activity has this waxing and waning course, but it really doesn't tell you about their disease severity. What tells you about their disease severity is the damage that's occurred and surgical procedures they've had over time and hospitalizations. That's what defines their severe case. For a second patient, you could say their disease activity at some point was exactly the same. Their, their CDAI score may have been exactly the same as that other patient at that moment in time. But following that patient over time, they have a very different disease severity, and we should be thinking about that patient in very different ways as far as how we think about not what we're doing today, but what we're going to do to maintain their health in the future. I want to make the point that this doesn't only occur with Crohn's disease, and John Fred and his group has taught us this very well, that damage occurs in ulcerative colitis as well. It's not just uh, Crohn's disease, and it may not be quite as obvious with ulcerative colitis, but we can have proximal extension of disease that we've learned can be very difficult to treat. Stricturing in ulcerative colitis is not always cancer. It can be the progression of the disease and damage as well. Pseudopolyposis, we all know if you're an endoscopist that this can be a real problem when you find a few polyps that come in a field of uh, pseudopolyps that are adenomatous and we really struggle with how to treat them. Dysmotility, anal rectal dysfunction, and impaired permeability are those patients that you just don't understand why they're having so many symptoms when you're thinking they probably have overlying irritable bowel syndrome, but in fact, a lot of it is damage that's occurred in ulcerative colitis because we didn't treat their disease aggressively early and let things progress into the point of no return in many cases. So here's the real problem that we deal with. We have very effective drugs, and if we think about biologics that are indicated for patients with moderate to severely active disease, we see patients who may not have that high disease activity at the time, and both us as providers, and even more so our patients, can get this false sense of security that everything's okay. You know, we're in between flares, I came off of prednisone, we're feeling all right, maybe let's give it just a few more months. Or on that second or third course of prednisone, we'll move on. But this false sense of security we deal with, with thinking about their disease activity at a moment in time, really can mislead us in what we need to do. And the patient does need to feel like they deserve biologics. And we've talked about this a lot at this meeting and others, that if people aren't sick enough, they may not feel that they deserve to move on to these more perceived powerful or sometimes threatening you know, perception of treatment 
where they're really our most effective treatment, that we need to get to them before they have the damage and before they have severe disease that may or may not be reversible. And certainly payers are a big part of this when we're told we can only use these treatments for patients with moderate to severely active disease that doesn't take into account their history and difficult course they may have had or will have in the future if we don't treat them appropriately because they don't have a high enough disease activity or enough symptoms to warrant using those treatments at that given time. This is just to remind you that the international definitions of disease activity really rely on symptoms. Whether you look at ACG criteria of mild to moderate, moderate severe, or severe fulminant, those are based purely on symptoms. There are a couple that take into account some of these complications, but by and large, when we're talking about treatment algorithms and how we take care of patients, we're putting them in one of these buckets. And please remember, this is disease activity. Again, not disease severity. So we've started to think about disease severity over the past couple of years and try to understand how can we really define this? And there are different domains that we have to think about. Of course, the impact on the patient is number one. And I'm not saying symptoms are irrelevant. They're always top on the list. But we have to think of it in the context of their overall quality of life, fatigue, disability, ways that their disease are, is affecting them. We need to take into account their complicated disease course. What's happened over time? Have they already had bowel damage? Have they have intestinal resections, perianal disease? What's their frequency of flares? And how about extra-intestinal manifestations that can really play on a patient's quality of life and overall disease severity? And then, of course, the inflammatory burden we can't think about, the objective markers that we have, not just at that time, but over time, what has been the full extent of their disease? What does their CRP do? What do their mucosal lesions look like, even if they're not feeling sick, need to drive how we're thinking about these patients? And although there are correlations and interactions between these domains, they don't necessarily need to be proportionate. There's a unique mix of what every patient brings from these domains to really help define their overall disease severity. And we need to remember that that both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis aren't just progressive disorders, but their disease severity will also progress if we let their disease get out of control and don't prevent those complications from occurring, as opposed to just trying to treat those complications after they occur. So this thought process led to this project that I wanted to describe to you, which is to develop an overall disease severity index, known as the overall DSI. And I was honored to be part of this project, working with the IOIBD, the International Organization for the Study of Inflammatory Bowel Diseases, to critically think through what are the components that we can use to redefine what we mean by severity and put some metrics around it. Can we give a score from zero to 100 so that we understand that although your patient's feeling fine that day, this is somebody who's had really severe disease over time, and we need to be very thoughtful about the next moves that we make for them. It comes with this recognition that disease severity components really are individual, and this shows two different types of patients. Here's an asymptomatic patient with extensive small bowel Crohn's disease and moderately active endoscopic lesions, and you can see that here their inflammatory burden and their complicated disease course really outweighs the direct impact on the patient at this point, yet may give them a very high disease severity compared to another patient with isolated short ileal stricture associated with disabling obstructive symptoms where their current inflammatory burden is very low, they have this single complication that's fortunately very li limited and amenable to a, a very simple resection, but a huge impact on the patient. So a different disease severity made up by the different components of these domains that we should be thinking about. Again, inflammatory burden, complicated disease course, and impact on the patient. So in thinking through this project, we had to come up with some attributes that need to be considered for what are the things that go into causing more or less severe disease. Here's the list for Crohn's disease. None of them are a surprise. Mucosal lesions, fistulas, prior surgeries, things related to damage, daily symptoms, experience with biologics, steroids, and impact on their daily activities. We did the same for ulcerative colitis, and you can see a similar list although it, it doesn't take into account all the damage that occurs or the obvious damage that occurs with Crohn's disease. The trouble here is that doesn't help you and it doesn't help your patient. It doesn't help us when you're sitting in the office just check off that your patient has these things. We need to wait or give certain things more credit than others so that we can really be thoughtful as far as how can we consistently score patients and understand how to follow them over time. 
So the technique we use is something that's uh, uh, fairly unique to medicine, although being used more and more now, and in fact, there's some of our colleagues who are using this to study inflammatory bowel disease, is something called conjoint trade-off analysis. I'll teach you just for two minutes about it because I think it's important to hear how we came up with these rankings and how this ultimate scoring system worked. This is a tool that's used to understand drivers of decision-making and consumer product choices. Historically, this is if you're looking at one car versus another car, it's not just about how it looks overall, it's about the individual attributes like the color, the radio that it comes with, the engine that it comes with, the cost effectiveness and the efficiency. These are things that we think about as different attributes and when you're looking at one versus another, in your mind you're weighing what's really more important to you. And that's the tact we took here. It measures decision makers' willingness to trade off certain attributes in favor of others. It's really a choice experiment. You're being given option A or option B, and you're asked to make a decision based on those attributes, and then there's a fancy mathematical formula that calculates these part worth utilities so that you can rank order what you're doing. In addition to shopping for cars, you've all done conjoint trade-off analysis, I bet you at one time or another. This is when you're sitting in the ophthalmologist's office, and they're asking you for A versus B and then you pick B and you're comparing it to C. And what you're doing is you're picking attributes of that moment of, that, of your visual experience to help you find the very best combination of attributes to find what your prescription is. So what we wanted to do is use this technique that can be used in medicine to find the attributes from that list from Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis that really drive disease severity. So the question to the panel was, which of these attributes in which scenarios of patients really drive you to think that a patient's more severe than another? This is an example of a conjoint trade-off analysis for a patient with Crohn's disease. You don't need to look through every line, but the idea is things that are in gray stay the same, and then other attributes are different. So you're deciding, is it patient A or patient B that has more severe disease? And then mathematically, when you do this enough times, there's a computer program that has an algorithm to figure this out. It identifies for that individual viewer which are the attributes that you're consistently using to make decisions about disease severity and which ones do you kind of ignore because they're less important. And when you run a series of these, there becomes a clear rank order amongst viewers of what's been used. So here we had about 20 people from the IOIBD look at this conjoint trade-off analysis, and we looked at all the results to rank order the attributes of disease for Crohn's and ulcerative colitis to see how they line up. It was interesting because it was different for the diseases. So for Crohn's disease, you can see that the things that were really driving disease severity, when asked what are the things that make this patient more severe, it was bowel damage. It was less about day-to-day -day symptoms that we actually think about and co collect, albeit importantly, the patient-reported outcomes, but the overall disease severity was really more about the damage that Crohn's disease occurs as opposed to their day-to-day -day experience with their disease. And ulcerative colitis was different. Ulcerative colitis was much more based on their symptoms and their experience and hospitalizations and medication utilization that drive that patient having more severe disease as opposed to the patient with Crohn's disease, again, that's driven more by damage. So you get this rank order, but still we need to find something that we can use to help score these patients. And you could find this publication that was just recently online at Gut, if you're interested in how the score works, to see that the things up top that drive this, again, for Crohn's disease or disease damage, and then for ulcerative colitis, the day-to-day -day experience in the disease. If you use this as a checklist, you get a score from zero to 100, 100 being the most severe patient, where zero is a, a patient with very uncomplicated or less severe disease. And this is a tool that we can start to use and think about and validate and how it really works in identifying those patients and driving our decisions for treatment. Again, it can't just be about symptoms that they have that day. It really has to be about their whole experience, but we need some way to formalize that to drive these decisions as opposed to arbitrarily thinking this patient kind of has bad disease or doesn't have bad disease. So to think about this practically in the clinic, of course, taking care of these patients isn't a straightforward what's happening today, and we're always thinking about what happened in the past and what we should be doing for the future. So the first question is disease activity. Again, I don't want to discount that the experience of that patient at that moment is important, it's just not important for the overall severity that we need to think about. So that disease activity guides the next move to get your patient better. And these are really relying on the patient reported outcomes and objective markers like endoscopy, imaging, laboratory testing. However, it's the overall disease severity 
that really guides the strategy for how to keep them better. You can try out the overall DSI and see how it feels and how it works in your practice, but at least if you take anything from this talk, please keep that in mind, that disease severity really is a different term than disease activity. And think about the overall experience of their disease as opposed to a moment in time as you're thinking about treatment strategies and approaches. So in summary, disease activity, again, is about a moment in time where disease severity really represents this longitudinal summary of their overall disease course. Crohn's disease severity is associated more with intestinal damage in contrast to UC disease severity, which is more dependent on symptoms and impact on daily life. Symptoms related to disease activity are a component of overall disease severity, but many factors need to be taken into account to understand the total impact of inflammatory bowel disease on our patients. So with that, thank you very much. Great to be here, and thank you for having me.